listened to. Uh, we talked about globalization and deglobalization. And uh, I think there was a lot of uh, hope in the room because our Indian and Vietnamese friends are very much on the globalization side, seeing that both countries are the new engines of globalization. I would also say that both countries are very much uh, at the focus point of the new ESG movement. Um, and you all know what ESG is, you know, the E, the S and the G, looking into the environment, uh, the social dimension and governance, which is not only a new kind of uh, conundrum, but it's a new mantra, I would say. Uh, or what companies should do, what societies should do, uh, and always reflecting also on, on the needs of the human being in relation with nature and society at large. So it's uh, my great pleasure to um, start and to trigger this panel, which is actually a joint initiative by Horasis and TCS, Tata Consultancy Services. And uh, the man who inspired uh, the initiative is right here, uh, Girish Ramachandran, who is running Asia Pacific for TCS. And uh, we discussed this panel a few weeks ago in Singapore, and we thought we should create something here in the context of India and Vietnam and relate um, ESG to both countries. So uh, without further ado, I would um, hand over to you, Girish, uh, to introduce the panel and, of course, to conceptualize the idea behind. Thank you, Frank. Um, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here speaking to all of you. This is a very interesting times that we are going through. First of all, we've, uh, when we are coming out of the pandemic, during the pandemic, we saw a lot of positive impacts on the awareness and actions on sustainability. And uh, if you look at all the, it came across from all s stakeholders, including investors, customers, partners, government, communities, as well as employees. We, as in a company today, we, we have around 650,000 employees worldwide. And um, most of our employees today are Gen Y and Gen Z. Average age of the company is 28. And when people want to join our company today, most of them ask us, why should they join us? Okay. Are you purpose driven? Okay. And that is the question that more and more uh, employees, especially the new employees are asking us when they join. Okay. And they're all expecting large organizations to deliver to the triple bottom line, which is people, profit, as well as the planet. Okay. We also, when you look at the business side, we have, um, we need to move away from net zero to net impact. That's, that is precisely what um, Rajiv and I speak about all the time. And um, if you look at today, the average age of a company in NASDAQ is less than 20 years. And um, companies like us, the Tata Group, have survived 150 years in business. So I think there is something that you know, organizations like us are doing right, which is helping us to be um, where we are. Okay. And there is also a lot of, lot of issues on investors. Investors are looking for purpose-led businesses and looking at what kind of matrices do they need to look at from companies. And um, there is also a lot of, um, I'm also on the supervisory board of one of the large um, reporting institutions called GRI. And a lot of organizations use GRI standards, but today there is a plethora of uh, stand sustainability standards coming up there. Okay. And so this is what we will actually try to discover during this um, time in this, uh, in this session. And when Frank and I discussed this, we said that it's, everybody is talking about ESG, but is there a way by which we can unpack ESG a little bit more and come to what, uh, what we need to look at? Uh, we've got a very interesting set of panels. Uh, I will, we've got uh, Himanshu who just flew in directly from Norway. Himanshu is uh, a member of parliament in the Norwegian assembly. Uh, thank you, Himanshu, for coming over. Yeah. Uh, we, have, uh, we have somebody from the social side who focuses a lot on social, and this is Rajiv. Rajiv essentially is the CEO of a company called Stewardship Asia. It's a think tank based out of Singapore completely owned by Tamasak, okay? And Rajiv will talk a little bit about uh, what doing good means. 
Uh, then we have, um, uh, we have Michael. Michael comes from Australia, from Sydney. He represents the manufacturing segment of all the organizations across in Sydney. Thanks, uh, Michael, to be here. And then uh, we have Professor Hain, uh, who is from the University of Technology here in, um, in Vietnam. Okay. So, this is, so we've got a very interesting panel. We've got somebody from the E side, which is Michael. We've got somebody from the S side, which is, which is Rajiv. We've got somebody from the governance piece, which is what Professor Hain is uh, very focused on. How do we uh, ensure that we run the governance piece? And then, of course, we've got somebody from the government who runs uh, what, what do governments need to do. Okay? So I'll give everybody a quick uh, two, three minutes just to start off their conversation. Um, Himanshu, if you're okay, you can start off directly from the flight, or Absolutely. you can take time as well, okay? I can, can you? Yeah. No, we just lost it. Now, let's try now. No? Thank you so much. First of all, I apologize so much no. for the uh, delay. I literally just ran from the, <laughs> from the aircraft uh, and to the taxi and right in here. Thank you so much, Dr. Victor, for the invitation to be here and for uh, being allowed to be part of this panel. It's a true, true uh, um, honor. Um, and um, uh, as somebody who uh, sort of has uh, one foot in, in in Norway, one of the countries perhaps known for best ESG policies in the world, and a foot in India, you know, the, the booming uh, dynamic uh, economy as it is, it's very, uh, you get very good perspectives of, of, um, of how things are. And ESG very often is considered something of a box ticker. You have to report on it, you have to do it to show shareholders, show the world that, that we have an ESG policy. But times have changed. This is something completely different uh, now. ESG is not just about good governance, but it's also about extreme opportunity uh, for your business model. I've had the pleasure, uh, I actually came straight from, from, from uh, India today, and I've had the pleasure of traveling around in India the past week, visiting, uh, for instance, the Ola factory, uh, producing um, electric two-wheelers, um, soon cars, battery factories, and I'm sure that we will see uh, Ola um, cars and uh, two-wheelers all over Vietnam, all over Southeast Asia, all over Africa. This will do more for EV and transformation of the vehicle sector than what Elon Musk and Tesla has done until now. I'm convinced of it after seeing what they're, they're doing because they haven't just chosen ESG as a, as a, uh, something as a box ticker or something they do in addition to their business. It's an integral part of their business. It's actually their business model. I visited a new factory in Bangalore, outside Bangalore, where all the workers are women. I've never seen this in India before. Yeah. A complete new world-class factory with only women working there. Uh, uh, and, and I'm sure we'll have prime ministers and ministers from all over the world standing in line to visit and seeing how this is working. This will be a model for the rest of the world. So my point is, to make it very short now, ESG is not a box ticker anymore. It's not just something you do on the side of your business. If you don't use ESG and its values, as part of your business model, as part of your focus in the future, then you are losing out on the big opportunities that are there. Uh, and India, as the home of uh, one sixth or one fifth of humanity, or whatever it is right now, uh, is, is a, an amazing opportunity, amazing market for anybody who wants to have solutions within the, the green and, and corporate responsible uh, way. Thank you. Thank you, Imanshu. Rajiv. Uh, thank you, Girish. So the fact that ESG and sustainability are the conversation is center stage is good news. It's good news because a lot of great solutions are being thrown at this problem, which is now existential. Uh, so for example, measurement and reporting is seen as one of the panaceas which will save the planet. Regulation, every government is introducing new regulation, which is a good thing to ensure good behavior. Incentives, tax incentives, compensation incentives, uh, and cheaper capital through green finance. All of these are governance solutions, the G of ESG. The question is, are these solutions enough to save planet Earth and humanity? And the second question is, all those companies and all those individuals and all those organizations that have created ESG excellence already, have they done it because of measurement and reporting pressure, regulatory pressure, incentives or cheaper capital? Girish, you are one of the passionate leaders of the ESG movement and what you drive through TCS. Have you done it through any of these? The answer is a big no. So when ESG excellence happens, what have we learned? 
We have learned that it is not driven through these solutions. It is driven by leaders who are a different kind of breed, who want to leave a legacy to have contributed to saving the next generation. And we call these people steward leaders. They, are, they see themselves as stewards of the planet. They decide that it is my duty to do something. They don't do it because of incentives or capital or regulation. So steward leadership is what is needed in today's world. And steward leadership is the genuine desire and persistence to create a collective better future. Not just for your shareholder, not just for your country, but a collective better future. Why collective better future? Because COVID has taught us one lesson. No one is safe until everyone is safe. So we need more steward leadership. We need more proactive action. And to do that, we need we think and our research is pointing to the fact that ESG should be upgraded to ESL, where L stands for leadership and in particular, steward leadership. Very good point, Rajiv. Thank you. Professor Hain, I think we'll start off with you. Um, first of all, it is my great honor being part of the panel discussion with a very, very important topic, ESG. Uh, I would like to briefly introduce a little bit uh, what I have done, actually. Um, if ESG is challenging for developed countries like European countries you mentioned, uh, it is much more difficult for developing countries like Vietnam. And I have been working with, uh, uh, currently I'm, I'm with university, but uh, we are trying to bring a, a strong linkage between university and industry. So that's why I'm also working with industry like uh, the regulator, SSC, the State, Secu State Security Commission, the stock exchanges, um, to help companies, listed companies, and also unlisted companies to improve corporate governance. And also now, uh, recently, is the E and the S. So um, I would like to share with you a little more, but I mean that uh, ESG has been more and more important uh, for a developing country from Vietnam, like we have very early, uh, very young uh, stock exchange, um, where we need a lot of capital for investment. So G is always the first item to come up with. But when the UN started with the 17 Sustainability Development Goal, uh, the Vietnam government's feeling like, okay, this is the, the, the start of it. But then it's still very late. Since 19, uh, 2015, we have seen some of the movement of the government. But nowadays, I agree with you. Um, we receive a lot of calls, not only from customer, investor, but also from all the all uh, stakeholders. Something really need to to be done for the ESG, and we are I'm very much willing to share with you uh, the aspects from uh, the Vietnam side. Thank, Thank you, you. Uh, <clears throat> Michael. You come from a different part of uh, of Asia. Um, or Australia, which is uh, very interesting because there has been a lot of, um, if you look at uh, the companies in Australia, um, there is a lot of significant talk from the businesses on how they need to move on the ESG pace. And I uh, would like to hear first your comments a little bit about what is Australia doing. And then um, I have a few other further, further thoughts as well, please. Yeah, sure. Well, uh, manufacturing represents 10% of Australia's workforce, right. so it's significant. And supply chains become vital I heard some of the previous speakers talking about that. Uh, so this builds this uh, whole ESG narrative around what does good look like? And so Australia, with such a small population, we need partners. We need to be an exporting nation. And so to build these collaborations between our great research minds with industry partners to develop world's best goods that we can manufacture. Uh, it's great to be here with the, the Lavo company who are uh, developing green hydrogen energy storage and so talking to uh, organisations here in Vietnam to look at uh, the opportunities for growth of this great Australian technology. Uh, I also represent the Texas organisation which is involved in road engineering and green roads. So in my mind, ESG is around a community scale. So you're talking about energy for a certain community or a state. You're talking about the green infrastructure that comes with it. Because right now in Australia, we have the lowest unemployment rate in our nation's history. And people are looking to work for good employers. They want to know that they have a future for their career. And that becomes not just for their own career, but for their family to be involved in that community. So I think we're going to hear a lot more about ESG at a, a much larger scale. 
Thank you. Uh, Rajiv, I'll, I'll get to you the next question, which is um, one of the big problems with ESG is um, how do you find a common purpose for all the stakeholders? Okay. And how do we align different stakeholders and bring them to a common purpose? Girish, in the previous panel, one of the gentlemen were talking about a very important issue that is prevalent today. They were talking about globalization, and the word they used was interdependence. Yeah. That, you know, the world is a lot more interdependent today than it ever was. You know, one part of the world uh, uh, sneezes and the other part of the world catches a cold. That's how bad. And COVID has reminded us how interconnected and interdependent we are. So this idea of finding common purpose is not a luxury anymore. We have to understand that our success depends and is intertwined with the success of others. And the more we work hard to make others successful, the more successful we will be. So it's an imperative now. It is not just a choice. If you want to do well, you have to do good. Uh, and by the way, consumers and customers and the next generation is absolutely demanding it. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's absolutely a must. And it's a question at the end of the day, how to find common purpose. In my opinion, in business, it's a question of proactively searching for a profitable business model that creates shareholder growth by addressing the very challenges that are threatening the world today. And according to the World Economic Forum, that's a $10.1 trillion a year in business opportunities. Thank you. Thank you, Rajiv. Um, Himansha, I'll come to you next. Now, um, we all know that um, government policies are very important for um, running things like ESG and bring ESG into the forefront. Okay? But do you think we should leave it to the business people to run um, ESG matrices? Or should, do you think government should intervene? And why do you think, if you think government should intervene, why do you think we should intervene? Government policies are important, but they are not at all enough. I, I think, in fact, Rajiv made a, a great point earlier. Uh, those who show by example, those who go forward as role models, those who are pioneers, are much more important than some politicians uh, writing a, a bill that, that nobody really reads. I mean, you can, you can tell people not to smoke, but the real reason they don't smoke is because they realize that it harms them. Uh, that's why you at least try to, so, so it's, um, policies are important because in the long run, they have an effect, but the true transformers, the, the, they are the leaders who go as examples and, and, and pioneers and, and, and start the change. So uh, politicians are not that important in this, uh, uh, in this field, uh, in this field either, some would say. Uh, we really need true global leaders showing the way. That will uh, make other uh, business leaders also wake up. And although in the beginning this might seem uh, like a bit of a nuisance, um, uh, after a while people realize that this is uh, something you need to do, if not you're, um, both for competitive reasons and, and for, uh, uh, for the right reasons. But Himanshu, you come from a part of the world which we all look up to, uh, especially Europe. Okay? And uh, even in Europe, we all look up to Nordics. And uh, so do you think, are you saying that uh, it's businesses who are driving all the changes on ESG across in Nordics, or do you think um, government has a part to play in that? Uh, it, it is not just businesses. Governments and policies has a part. But it is very easy for somebody who comes from Norway or Scandinavia. Uh, my country has a population of five and a half million. Scandinavia has 20 million among the richest uh, area in the world. It's very easy for people from there to school others in what to do. We could go forward because it was easier for us. Uh, we don't, it, it's not the same to sit in Vietnam or India or other places. Uh, the circumstances are different. But I, I think we've come to a point now in the world where, where people realize that this is not just something you do uh, because it's, it's, uh, it's nice to do. It's something you do because you need to do it in order to uh, uh, form the society around you in a good way when it comes to sustainability environment when it comes to being competitive, uh, because this is what consumers are looking for, and also to keep the talent. If you're not a company that has the right values in, in how you treat your employees uh, uh, and, and how you treat the environment, well, then you're not going to get the best talent. So uh, it was easy for the Nordics and Europe to perhaps go further with the circumstances and the, the benefits, advantages we had as uh, a place with relative little population, uh, good uh, uh, economy. Uh, it's not been as uh, easy for the rest of the world, but, but, 
but now the world will will go uh, past Europe and past the Nordics and excelling in uh, all the uh, three and even four aspects of, of ESG as we mentioned here. Frank, I want to put you on the spot. I want to ask you an interesting yes. question. You come from Europe where um, obviously there is a war going on and uh, because of the war we are seeing a lot of companies roll back on on their own ESG promises, on their net zero promises. A lot of countries who are averse to coal is bringing back coal. Um, and uh, we also saw it just two days back, um, Britain's new, um, uh, at least tax policy and, and what does it mean for the environment as a whole. You, have, you come from that area. What, what is your view, Frank, on this? <laughs> First of all, I should say that I like the new concept of ESL, you know, the leadership dimension. And maybe that's something which is lacking right now, especially in Europe. Yeah. Um, and, you know, to, to bring Europe and the world together and to tackle those issues together. And not just going, you know, for your own way, but uh, for, you know, the, the whole uh, humanity, which is at risk uh, at this current moment. In Europe, of course, yes, you know, there's a big issue now. It's an energy crisis. There's, of course, inflation and many other problems. But on the energy side, yeah, you know, um, many countries go back to, uh, to coal, um, to gas, uh, to, to nuclear. Uh, and, uh, you know, many of the ESG efforts might be delayed. But on the long term, I think it will come back strongly because we all feel now there's no other choice. Um, we have to do it. We have to um, uh, really... Uh, go beyond uh, the fossil uh, economy and, and go into the uh, sustainable, um, uh, you know, and, and regenerative uh, economy. And uh, I think, you know, Europe and, and all other countries, uh, they know that. And um, it's just a small delay, but we will overcome it. Thank you, Frank. Gives us optimism. Uh, I'll come to Hein next. Okay. Let us come to Vietnam. Let's understand a little bit about uh, what is ESG, because Vietnam obviously is... Uh, because of the rebalancing of the supply chain, there's a lot of manufacturing coming to Vietnam. Do you see a significant um, push towards ESG when all the new manufacturing setup is coming to Vietnam? What is your view on, um, is ESG a priority today in Vietnam? Thank you, Rirish, for the question. Um, let me share with you a little bit about a picture of Vietnam, actually. Um, we started the uh, stock exchange in 2000, so uh, so far we have only about uh, 20 years old for uh, stock ex uh, exchange. And the stock market uh, uh, is kind of mechanism for us to believe that we can get financing from international. Um, but then um, with the very um, kind of ambitious objective of the government to grow the stock exchange to like uh, a size market cap of 100% of the GDP. Uh, we, at the same time, produce a lot of companies to the market. So aiming to have like 1 million companies uh, by 2025. And so far, we have already 700,000 companies. So you can imagine company needing a lot of capital, even though we have a lot of investment opportunities. But uh, without capital, Vietnamese company cannot grow so fast. So this is kind of motivation for Vietnamese company to improve corporate governance. But just until 2008, we really have the concept of what it is corporate governance. So it's still new to us until 2008. So the, the very first decree issued by the government calling the name of corporate governance was just come in in 2007. And then after that, about seven years, or eight years, we starting to, to talk about what it means by sustainability only after the UN starting the SDG. Uh, but the improvement, the actual improvement in corporate governance of companies is still very slow. We are talking about a listed company only, those companies that we expect them to be most transparent because they have uh, public liability. But then, uh, how we do that? So it's very good question that you raised that. Is regulation important? I may say yes for developing country because uh, regulation set the foundation basis. But then uh, the courts, the best practice principles, they are above regulation. But if you don't move companies to reach the regulation yet, it's very far that you can move them above or beyond the regulation. 
So since then, since 2007, um, not only the regulators uh, and also an enforcement mechanism of the regulators. We also seen that uh, Vietnam has uh, get support a lot from international funding company like IFC, World Bank, ADB. They step into the picture to help. So what do they do? They're actually doing a lot of motivation to promote uh, best showcase. So uh, they run a lot of awards for those companies that are doing good in governance. But then the movement is still very slow until Vietnam joined the ASEAN um, in an initiative we call uh, ACMF, uh, ASEAN Co Capital Market Forum. And then under the ACMF, they do a lot of activity as well to improve corporate governance. So Vietnam improved faster and faster in, in that uh, project, I mean, regional initiative. Uh, but G is still faster and also is still the most attractive item in E and S and G. And uh, S and G come just later. And then uh, we are very hopeful now when the government has issued a lot of uh, decree and also uh, the, the prime minister also issued a lot of de decision just recently in July of 2020 uh, calling for the real action for ENS and we could say that no more awareness stage Vietnam now step into the implementation uh, implementation stage but then how we do that so your question saying that uh, what is the priority right now I could say that that is the first priority in the government agenda and now it moved to the ministry agenda industry agenda manufacturing companies agenda uh, we expect that there is a lot of change in the in the coming years mm, but it's difficult talking about implementation like you talk but what you do is difficult thing right yeah so uh, that is what I would like to share no, I have uh, one thought on this. I just wanted to hear from you and Rajiv on this. Quickly. You, you teach governance uh, in your, in your, um, in your uh, school, uh, schools and business schools. And if you look at most of the failed companies, um, failed companies in the stock Failer. market or whatever it is, has happened because of poor governance. Okay. So how do you teach uh, governance um, into the board today, most people, uh, most people in the board that I talk to don't understand ESG well. Okay, how do you get, how do you teach ESG into the into the, into people in the board? Uh, very interesting question. Um, um, besides teaching for my business school in university, I also uh, doing uh, collaboration with the Institute of Director in Vietnam, and they also teach the real people in the board. So uh, actually, they understand what it means. But like I mentioned, uh, putting in the agenda and actually implement it, there is still a gap. Um, companies nowadays setting up mechanism, procedure, policy to uh, monitor the corporate governance in their company. So um, a lot of movement in that side. Uh, for example, uh, companies nowadays setting up audit committee in the board. Uh, Many companies going far away from the traditional model that we have like sub, uh, supervisory board above the board of director. Now we remove supervisory board, we move the uh, internal audit, I mean audit committee inside the board, meaning that they, they look at the risk with a more serious uh, uh, point of view. So audit committee has done a lot of job in terms of governance, control for risk, setting up the risk management system inside the company, monitoring it, uh, setting up the internal audit the independently from the management and reporting to the, uh, the board of directors. That is an uh, independent internal control to uh, control the behavior of the managers at different levels. So what I mean is that uh, why failures and scandals still happen? Um, I don't think it's a surprise for Vietnam because uh, we always have to be prepared that failure and scandals are always there. Only you cannot find it soon. It is because of your fault. So um, we, we educate them not in a way of uh, telling them what it means, but uh, reminding them that uh, everybody knows what you are doing. But uh, be careful that uh, when the market speak, then uh, scandal and uh, failures and uh, kind of frauds 
will soon be um, uh, revealed. But uh, recently, you have seen a lot of issues in the stock market in Vietnam as well. So I think uh, governance is still a very, very um, uh, difficult and challenging area. But then, uh, with the help of regulation and enforcement, still G is under control. But E and S is more uh, difficult because it's some, somehow not like man mandatory. It is more uh, voluntary, voluntary basis. So, so that is the challenge that I want to mention. How can we make it happen for E and S? We rely too much on the willingness of business. But that is not the, the time right now. This is the time that we have to convert it to mandatory action. But how we do it? Of course, I believe regulation should be the first. Raji, what is your view, Raji? Is it, is it putting together a chief ESG officer or chief sustainability officer <laughs> reporting to the board? Is that, does it, will it solve the problem? So you mentioned that you know uh, failures are all because of bad governance, right? Now, I think the problem is that we are trying to teach governance. And governance is all based on regulatory compliance. And as you said, regulation sets a floor, a bare minimum standard of good behavior. If you don't do this, you go to jail, right? Is that minimum behavior going to save the world? Heck no. The magnitude of the challenges that we are facing today need much higher levels of behavior. Regulation and compliance and therefore governance talks about minimizing risk. I say we need to take much more risk to come up with innovative business models that address ENS challenges. So we have to rely less on the G and we have to teach L, which is about taking the risk, which is about creating more innovation, which is about coming out as entrepreneurs and saying, I take responsibility to find solutions to these problems. The problem is we are using G, which is all about the floor, which is all about the base level. If just because I don't break the law and just because I follow the law and comply with the law and file the report doesn't make me a responsible company. A responsible company is who's somebody who is setting the standard of leading the way. And that is what we need to teach uh, with due respect. A very, very interesting point. Um, I'll f one, uh, one final question with, uh, with Michael and then I'm going to open the floor for questions. Michael, you wear different hats. And um, one is your own company, and the other one is about your association with uh, manufacturers in Australia. Are you re really seeing manuf manufacturing companies or businesses leveraging technology for sustainability? If you can give some examples of that. Yeah, and big time. I mean, it's really accelerating. I mean, it's, it's great to be here the last couple of days and see the enabling infrastructure that's being constructed you know, with the Texas organization, my experience with Roadworks, the green technology that can be used for roadworks now in particular. Um, I'm seeing the community scale that we, I talked about earlier happening here. Uh, and the Beckenbach Corporation, the meetings I've had the last couple of days, you can see the potential for building this strong industrial community, which I think is great. Um, but earlier on, uh, when the pandemic first hit, and I'll give you an example around manufacturing, um, we needed ventilators in Australia and we did not have any manufacturing company that could make invasive ventilators. So we were able to bring together a supply chain across uh, Sydney and Brisbane, Sydney and Brisbane and Melbourne, across three states to build this supply chain that could build a very complex piece of equipment. And we did that in less than three months. And we produced thousands of ventilators. But the good news around that and how Australian manufacturing was able to come together, use technology, demonstrate that we have those capabilities was the fact that when the second wave of COVID came through our good friends in India, we were able to export those critical ventilators to India. Uh, so it's been a great privilege of mine to be an industry advisor to the Australia-India Business Council. But those types of things that can demonstrate what good looks like um, show the whole manufacturing community right across Australia what the potential is. And so, um, in the last few days, as I say, being here, uh, there's another Australian company that has joined me called Lavo Hydrogen Technologies. They make green energy storage. One thing in Australia we have is lots of sunshine. Uh, we're blessed as a nation to have great resources right across the country. Uh, but to literally bottle that sunshine and store it as hydrogen, yeah. um, that's a great potential for um, the environment, but also to show uh, 
what, how we can create a community and um, potentially in, in an area like here in Vietnam to produce green, cheap energy for manufacturing would be a game changer. Thank you. Uh, leave the floor for questions. Yes, please. You have, we have two people. Okay. Three, four. Okay. If you can introduce yourself and ask whom you are asking the question. Uh, my name is Devan Narang and uh, I'm in Renewable Energy, come from Delhi. And Girish, it's good to meet you actually after 20 years. We met in Hague when you were there, if you remember. <laughs> so this is a very apt subject and a very important subject. And I have heard with very passionately Rajiv giving a new word, Stuart Leadership and uh, Himanshu as well. But my question to the panel is that while you wear a Tata hat, it's very easy to talk about ESG when you're a large corporate. In India and Vietnam, we have a lot of MSMEs. Now, if MSMEs have to do ESG, the compliance cost, as you would understand, uh, Girish, is so high in India that the MSME just can't afford to do it. They'll be out of business. So therefore, we've got to think differently. And I believe the panel or you, and Rajiv, should actually suggest to both the governments that there should be a, a kind of a cluster approach where MSMEs can actually treat the environment, uh, P1. And secondly, if the government, first of all, I don't believe the government should interfere because businesses who have done well, and if you look at the IT sector, they grew because there was no government norms, otherwise it would have been very, and I'm quoting India's example, uh, is to actually provide some tax breaks so that the small MSMEs could actually work towards treating the environment. And of course, you can put in all the governance laws, and it's very, very tough. I mean, I know what compliance in India is. We have a compliance officer, we have a EHS officer, and it is tough, you know, at the time when the big four or any auditor has to sign your balance sheet, you better make sure that everything's uh, uh, done, otherwise, you know, as a director, you're, you're in. So I think some kind of a system has to come in where uh, the MSME sector has to realize, because that's the bulk of employment, and perhaps companies like TCS and other big corporates should, for the, should start a program with the vendors, and I'm sure you already have it, where big corporates at least make the vendors ESG compliant and very aggressively put the systems in which others can follow. Thank you. Thank you. Himanshu, you want to answer, yeah. especially from, because we see so many small companies in, in the Nordics. Hmm. And so, uh, what do you do there? It's, it's probably so some... MSMEs are definitely the backbone of uh, any economy. And, and uh, there's a very good point being raised that the cost of, of uh, uh, governmental decisions must not be uh, so much that it, it, it holds the businesses down. I think we need more tax incentives. We need to uh, 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 incentivize and, and give tax breaks and other economic incentives to those companies who fulfill uh, regulatory um, um, uh, or other goals that are, are set. But on the other hand, I, I disagree with, with one point that was made as well. I, I think that MSMEs often are better at transforming themselves than large corporations because uh, of the way they are driven. Uh, they can often adopt uh, change. Uh, in an easier way, because we've seen many, many big corporations who, who, who are often too big to, to be able to transform themselves. So I think there's an opportunity there, but you are absolutely right. Instead of becoming a burden, uh, um, uh, ESG goals and, and other standards, especially on the environmental side, should be used as, um, as tax but then, And I can use one example from my own country. Again, I'll use the EV example, because Norway has the highest number of EV vehicles in the world. 80% of all new cars that are sold are EV. Uh, and the reason is that we removed every single tax there is uh, on EV uh, vehicles, making it cheaper and therefore also easier for, for companies, whether you're a delivery company or you're a, uh, a transportation company or you're any other company who needs uh, cars or vehicles, making it easier uh, to, to choose an environmental friendly option than buying another uh, petrol or, or diesel car.
Thank you. Maybe we'll just get to the, we have lots of people raising their hands, so we'll, we'll get to the questions first and then just. Thank you. My question is, how to make the sustainability effort sustainable? And I apologize for the politically incorrect aspect of my question, because I believe very much in all what you said. Now, the reality is, as Frank indicated, that in Europe, currently, most of the countries are flatly ignoring all what they had promised to do, going back to nuclear, going back to coal. That's the reality. I was a few months ago, I think it was in Davos, at a meeting where the discussion was how to work on the CO2 in a war. Well, the reality is that nobody cares. You, you want to kill your enemy. You don't care how many CO2 emissions you do in killing your enemy. So, it seems that there is good weather policy where all those things have their space and most of the politics in Europe were about green, environment, until we had the war in Ukraine and suddenly you have bad weather policy which is actually realpolitik. So the question is, how to overcome the hardness of that real politic? Would it be by having a superior body? When I look what happens in the UN in New York this week, I'm not so much convinced that we are going in the right way. I like very much the idea of saying that it's going beyond just uh, following the rules it's leadership. So is it training people with a different mindset? Is it convincing people that we have the same goals, the same needs? I think COVID was a place where everybody understood that we had to find a global solution. How to do that? So my question is, beyond the, the nice little music, which is so beautiful to our ears, what are the concrete ways to really make the sustainable effort sustainable? Very good question. Frank, you want to take it up, Frank, a little bit? You are <laughs> because the same question I brought you, I asked you as well. You got the, the broader view. <laughs> I'd love to make a comment later also. But maybe just a, a quick uh, perspective. A quick perspective on that. Um, I think, you know, every country is, um, you know, um, going ahead uh, on its own. And of course, we have uh, the European Union and uh, we, we got, of course, the UN, the UN uh, General Assembly is uh, happening right now. But we see that uh, global governance, I'm using the chi again, and it should be leadership actually, there's no real global, global governance left. There are no kind of binding rules. There are always exceptions. And um, I think we have to rework multilateral thinking yeah. and uh, to make really uh, multilateral thinking sustainable. Uh, you know, where we have some very concrete measures every country has to follow. And uh, I think we need a stronger United Nations, not a weaker one. No, thanks. I think, uh, uh, Himanshu, <laughs> no, uh, 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 I, I want to just add one more thing yes. to what he said. More and more countries are becoming more nationalistic now, yeah. especially after yeah. COVID, okay? And I just want to add that as well. And everybody's looking at their own interest rather than looking at the larger planet, so. I think the term that was used, making sus the sustainable movement sustainable, was a very good way to putting it because um, if you make something more um, uh, uh, difficult and more expensive for people and businesses that they need, you are not making their lives easier. For instance, uh, to go back to, to fuel, if you make fuel energy something uh, we are dependent on in our e everyday life more expensive, we are not making people's lives easier. Therefore, we need incentives, we need innovation, we need to make it easier to choose the right options not make uh, people's and businesses' everyday lives uh, uh, harder and more expensive if they continue on the old path. We need incentive and we, we need to um, uh, inspire by leadership, by, by, by good governance, by, by good uh, tax rules, by, by other good um, uh, uh, rules from the government side, 
incentives, not uh, not the, the carrot, not the stick. That's what we need, and especially in a world now with with the, with the war in Europe and everything, where everything is already getting more and more difficult, we don't need to make people's lives even more uh, difficult. Yeah, first of all, sir, thank you very much for raising a very, very important and excellent question. By the way, you know why people say it's an excellent question? Because they think that they have a good answer to give, sir. <laughs> anyway, but no, jokes apart, thank you for raising that. Just incidentally, the next book that I'm writing, you'll be glad to know that the title of my book is exactly that, Making Sustainability Sustainable. So that's my next book. It's coming out in about six months. Uh, but I think you answered your question yourself, sir which is we need to teach a whole different mindset. It is a question of take. So there are two, or two of the four values of steward leadership are one, interdependence, which was talked about in the previous session, and I was very pleased to hear that conversation, as I said, that we need to understand that our success depends on others and vice versa. That's a mindset that needs to be taught. And the other is, uh, is, is taking ownership. Each of us have to take ownership to do whatever little we can do and that mindset has to happen. With due respect to uh, the earlier conversation we were having, we cannot pass on the problem to either government, right, or to big companies. Big company, small company, individual, country, we all have to think interdependent and we all have to take ownership to do whatever it is that we can do. It is the small steps that each of us will take collectively that will save the world. And so you're right, it has to be a change of mindset and new kind of training that is needed. Thank you, Rajiv. We'll go to the question over there, yeah. Um, good evening, everyone. So. Um, it's not my question, but um, this man questions, but I would like to help him interpret his idea. Sure. Okay, he say, my name is Nghi, and I'm the chairman of Zhong Hao Company in Vietnam. This is a company that has solid waste recycling technology with a large uh, capacity, which can participate in creating value in the circula circular economy, the co as waste recycling technology of coal fire power plants has been patented by the Intellectual Property Office of India. We have also just been notified by the U.S. Intellectual Property Office that we have patented this technology. Coal ash is produced by U.S. is artificial sand. We, they have the same range of applications as natural sand. And I have a question. We want to participate in coal ash waste treatment for India, then how and which factors we should take into account if we want to cooperate with large corporations like Tata or Adani? Thank you. Thank you. It's a very good question and thank you for your interest in what we want to do in India. In fact, uh, we have a large delegation from the Confederation of Indian Industries here. We'll be very happy to see how we can facilitate a meeting with uh, uh, parties who are very keen on this to take this particular thing forward. So please, please do meet after this and I'll, I'll ensure that we introduce you to the right people. We had a question there, right? This one, you, you, are, you are standing up, right? Yeah, please, yeah. Thank you. Um, my name is Natalia Blokhina. I'm a co-founder of a global non-profit advancing women-led high-tech, high-growth potential entrepreneurship. And uh, I've been very much involved for the last 15 years to the corporate social initiatives and impact investing and ESG in the role of a corporate officer or a venture investor. So my question is very practical. I want to actually connect the previous conversation about the surging global debt and uh, the problems of SME and ESG and corporate responsibility. Let's take Vietnam and India in particular with uh, uh, many SMEs. What will be the practical actions and who can take them in the coming year or two to support the trade financing? to support the supply chain financing and uh, to improve the payment terms and all the things that can be the real uh, materialization of the S in the ESG of the public companies. Thank you. 
Do you want to take it up, Hain, Professor Hain, about what, what can India and Vietnam do together? And maybe some examples from Australia will also help. Or do you want to take first, Michael? I can give you some examples and around small, small business in particular because uh, the majority of Australian manufacturers are small companies. Yep. They employ less than 20 staff. Um, but the startup community is very strong uh, in India, as we know, and there's yep. uh, good collaboration happening across the startup community globally more and more each and every month. Um, I'll give you one example. In Australia, is a female founder company in regional New South Wales has developed a, a new plant-based meats uh, business. And what they're doing is the power of collaboration. So this um, small business startup is working with a much larger corporation who grows the wheat. And so this is building their supply chain. They're learning the experience of the much larger player. Uh, they're looking at the export potential because, as I said earlier, we need more Australian companies to export. So collaboration will be the key driver, um, and not just for getting their product to market, but you're learning from that bigger player about how can I get access to finance? How can I get funding to support this new venture to grow? Because it is new technology uh, partnered with the universities, so great research going into Australian startup ecosystem and then going out into the world. Uh, I agree with uh, the way you described it. I know there's um, so much potential, uh, particularly for startups, and I think it's beholden on all of us to uh, help form and uh, those collaborations and, and let that flourish. Do you want to add anything more? Um, the role of a uh, woman in um, uh, the social activity for companies actually are called for for many years. And uh, in Vietnam, we have done a lot of uh, different ways, but then uh, I have seen that uh, uh, collaboration between uh, institution, institutional investors, governments, and also association for, uh, supporting for the women leadership has come out to kind of significant improvement. We have more and more uh, ladies on the board. Uh, we also have a lot more of initiative uh, setting up to protect the right of the women in uh, uh, labor force. So I believe that um, uh, for the case of Vietnam, we believe that we need to learn more from uh, India uh, in terms of uh, social factor for uh, women uh, uh, benefit and also uh, the importance of women in the workforce. I had a very, very uh, <coughs> uh, interesting um, statistics which I got only last, a month back. If you look at the number of startups today in the world, only 3% of them are run by women, which was really appalling. I, I got the statistics uh, from the UN. There is, uh, there is an organization called the Health Innovation Exchange. I'm on the board of that. And the Health Innovation Exchange actually last week, uh, three days back in the in the United, uh, in, uh, in, um, in the Assembly, UN General Assembly, we launched a new fund called the Win Fund. The whole idea behind Win Fund is women investment fund, uh, especially for startups. Because it was pretty appalling to see uh, only this, this particular statistics, to see how we can get uh, more and more women to be founders and co-founders of large, uh, um, large uh, startups. Very interesting to look at it. Okay, I, uh, I think we are running out of time, so I want to give um, one last opportunity for, uh, okay, we'll just take that last question there and then, then we'll get everybody to give a quick wind up, okay. Thank you, uh, Mike Dury is my name. I am the editor in chief and uh, head of Purpose Driven Change with an organization called The Digital Economist. It's a, an impact organization operating globally. And just, I want to take, the, uh, take advantage of this opportunity of the queue you just gave and give a plug for a panel I'll be hosting tomorrow morning on female leadership. But <laughs> what I really wanted to mention is in this context of corporations doing the right thing and how much coercion is necessary from the governance side, there's a book I'd like to mention by a brilliant woman named Rebecca Henderson. It's called Reinventing Capitalism for a World on Fire. And one of the things that she mentions, she has a consulting background and is now in academia. One of the things she mentioned is that in her consulting experience, a lot of heads of uh, hedge funds, large corporates, 
are very much aware of sustainability issues and the threat to the climate and would dearly like to do the right thing. However, without regulatory, regulatory sorry, support and backing, they're afraid their investors won't go along with it. And I wonder if anyone would like to comment on that from experience or give a, a view. Thank you. I think uh, because of time, I'm going to ask everybody to summarize, but if they have any special comments on this particular topic, we'll get this. We'll start off with you. Um, thank you very much for your question. I, I think um, the question is uh, kind of uh, related to one of the questions that uh, Girish mentioned before. Uh, is there any like uh, a collaborative uh, initiative between investors and the business people to make ESG become like a, 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 more, a faster movement action. I believe that the size of the ESG-based uh, uh, management funds or mutual funds growing very quickly uh, in the year of 2021 and 2020, early 2022, more than two times uh, of the size. It shows that the investors in general, they are now uh, uh, going toward the uh, ESG and they realize that it is important. So we expect that the institutional investor will, uh, will be the second force beside the regulators to force the business people to actually change. So how do we do that? I believe that the role of uh, stewardship of the institutional investor is very important when they work with the board members to put the ESG into the real action of the board agenda and make it happen. So I believe that regulation is important. But I mean that the new initiative from institutions, from the international funds, we have seen it uh, become strongly and more and stronger and stronger recently, working toward and investing more for ESG company and work, uh, working more in investing to uh, energy safe um, uh, uh, technology and also many other technology to save the planet. So I mean that uh, the role of institutional investor is also very important to, to make ESG become like collaborative initiative uh, of uh, investor and business. Thank you. Michael, your, your summary? Yeah, just um, technology will always play a role. And so a lot of the discussion questions have been around energy. Um, I formed the Nuclear Skills Forum in Australia just last year. Uh, and then um, you've seen the orders in the UK now for small modular reactors. So Australian manufacturers are now engaging with Rolls-Royce in the UK. They're engaging with new scale power in the US to say that we have technology in Australia that we can collaborate with you. And so quite often I'll get a call from people and say, oh, but this small modular reactor technology is 15 years away. And my immediate response is, the Tesla motor car did not exist 15 years ago. And so it's all about this collaboration that I've kept touching on because this is around the, the E, the environment, uh, and building manufacturing. We're going to need more and more energy. Uh, I recently had Deepak Bagla, the CEO of Invest India in Sydney, and he was, the numbers he was uh, talking about were staggering. Uh, something like 45 million new homes, and he needs the energy to power the grid. Uh, so I think there's this collaboration between nations but also back to collaboration between our great researchers and industry will set the path forward. Thank you. Rajiv? Yeah, so sir, I'll try to address uh, at least a small part of your question. Your question's a very big one, and clearly, uh, you know, a minute is not enough to address it, and I don't have all the answers either, but just one point I'd like to make to it, and that is about looking at it from an investment and the wealth management industry perspective. So what do investors want? Investors want growth. They want their investments to to, to reap dividends and grow and, 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 and above average share, shareholder returns. That's what the investment industry is after, right? Now, if you look at historically how wealth has been created, it has been created by addressing the biggest pain points of society. Whether it was Andrew Carnegie or Vanderbilt or Henry Ford or Rockefeller, they looked at and pinpointed this is the industry problem. Today, the, the society is reeling because there is no way to transport goods from one place to the other. So the railroad comes in, and that's how Vanderbilt makes his money. Everybody who created substantial wealth did it because touching. Today's biggest pain points in industry are climate change and income inequality. And the next set of billionaires are going to be those that are actually going to solve for that. So 
if you want to do right by investors, then focus on these two problems. That's what I would like to say. And finally, uh, in terms of summary, uh, allow me 30 seconds more. Uh, as I was saying earlier, uh, sharing with my friends here, you know, in a conference I spoke at the day before yesterday, I said, the good news is that everybody is talking about ESG today. The bad news is that everybody is talking about ESG today. So we need to stop talking and start doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rajiv. Manchu. Thank you, and, and thank you for, for the, this uh, wonderful um, uh, debate and, and talk that we've, we've had. So I, I will use one it's example amazing. of female inclusion and female leadership uh, and try to set up three ways of attacking it. Number one is that uh, people or leaders do it uh, out of their own, uh, call it idealism. It's sort of, a, as I mentioned, the fact in India that only had female leaders. That's, that's one way to do it. The other way to do it is uh, because the government tells you. For instance, in Norway, we had this policy 20 years ago that 40% of all board members had to be, be women. Uh, I don't think necessarily that's the best way to do things because it's the government putting a gun to your head, but it can be effective. <laughs> the third way to do it is what you sort of pointed out. It's a leadership role to show why doing the right thing is good for your business, why being social uh, responsible, while including uh, both genders, why doing things in an environmental friendly way is good for your returns, good for your employees, good for your customers. Uh, because it is usually, but, uh, but it's a leadership role to show, because uh, you mentioned earlier, the, the first question was, how do we get all stakeholders on a sort of a minimum uh, or common agenda. It is by showing, by doing these right things is good for your business. Uh, uh, and, and again, in the end, that is a leadership uh, role. Frank, you want to give your summary? <laughs> it was a great panel, Girish. Thanks for sharing Thank it, inspiring it. And of course, thanks to everybody. And just a very quick summary. I would say that uh, ESG is here to stay. It's really um, the, at the focus of everything we should do. And, um, um, you mentioned before, uh, companies not respecting ESG principles will perish. Yeah. It has to be part of the business model, and uh, there's no other way. And uh, maybe that's um, uh, a summary, or a quick summary. I will give you the last word, Girish, but before I do that, just some housekeeping notes. Uh, we are now gathering downstairs for a uh, welcome cocktail, and you're, of course, all invited to join. But I give you the last word, Girish. Thank you. I think it was a very interesting uh, panel. Um, this is a pet topic of mine, so um, it's very interesting to hear that the conversation has just begun. Uh, the jury is not yet out, whether it is governance, whether it is the responsibility of the business, whether it's the responsibility of enterprises, or whether it is, uh, what is what is good. But Rajiv finally made a very good thing. It's finally leadership from all of us. All of us need to do what is good what we genuinely believe is right for us. It need not be in our roles as an organization, but can also be in our role as an individual as well. Okay. If we start moving that one step ahead, uh, the world will become much more nicer, and uh, we, we, we'll have a much safer planet to live for the next generation. Thank you. On that optimistic note, I would like to leave this particular thing session. Thank you.